I'm going to start off here with just uh, some brief introductions, and we're each going to do our own introductions uh, amongst ourselves. I am the non-doctor, the non-professor up here. So uh, as the moderator, one of, the, one of my deals is I don't have to answer any questions. I just get to ask them. Um, my name's Kevin Hale. I'm a chemical engineer, a graduate of Purdue University from many years ago. And I've spent my career in pharmaceuticals in the last several years in radio pharmaceuticals. So we've had the opportunity to work with Shine, uh, we've worked with the pharmacy, the radio pharmacy department here at Purdue, and uh, we'll just, uh, I'll put a plug in for Purdue. This is a great place for not only the, the, the uh, fusion technology itself, but also all of the ancillary products and benefits from it, from radiochemistry to radiopharmaceuticals to supply chain and, and all that that is involved. So I'm currently with a company called Nucleus Radio Pharma. It's a startup in, in this space, and we're actually taking the products from, from um, the, the fusion process from, from companies like Sh excuse me, Shine and making radiopharmaceutical drugs for that. And in fact, I'm leaving here uh, shortly after this session to head up to uh, Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, where on Friday we should get our occupancy permit and be able to start doing some chemistry. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I'm Lucy Taliarka, I'm a professor in nuclear engineering. Um, I'm Kara Weatherman, I'm a professor in the College of Pharmacy, uh, specializing in nuclear pharmacy, where we're we dispense the radio pharmaceuticals, but also with some uh, interaction with radio pharmaceutical manufacturing. Is this a new group, or does everyone know me already? I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's pass. laughs> He's still the same person. Um, my name is uh, Alan Garner, I'm a professor of nuclear engineering. Uh, my research group studies plasma physics, pulsed power, high power microwaves, and also biomedical applications of those technologies such as uh, gene delivery and cancer treatment. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm uh, Stylianos Hadzidakis. Uh, I guess we're competing with Professor Taligerken, who has the longest name. <laughs> so I'm an assistant professor at the School of Nuclear Engineering. Uh, I'm also the associate reactor director for PR1. Um, in other words, we have a reactor on campus and you can come and visit and it's really cool and you can see the Cherenkov <laughs> radiation that Greg was talking about. It's really exciting. Uh, and my research mostly focuses on how we can leverage um, the reactor and the full digital INC that it has to apply new technologies to improve fission, uh, such as we can apply AI machine learning to make the reactor more efficient, uh, more um, less downtime, detect anomalies, and also how we can develop digital twins to improve again efficiency uh, and defend against um, cyber attacks and, and these sort of things. So thank you. All right, thank you. So our discussion today, I'd like to eventually get to a point where we, we come down to what can university specifically, what can Purdue University be doing to support this kind of technology advancement? So we'll start out with some general questions, but little by little, I wanna get into more specifics to what can we be doing with the various departments here at Purdue University to support the, uh, again, fusion technology and radio pharmaceuticals and all of uh, radio isotopes and all that's involved. So let me start off with uh, just, we, we actually have some questions that were written in advance. You talked a little bit about the strategy to do this in phases. So, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, do it step by step, you generate some revenue along the way. There's now much more interest, and especially as, as you prove the technology, what does the group see as the, the competition that could come up behind and maybe even pass down the road? You know, while, while, you, while you know, uh, Shine is working on step by step, what else is out there and who else is out there and how, could, how can they possibly even move faster? I can take a shot at that on the fusion front. Yeah. So there's a, a, a bunch of companies that are working on going straight to power, right? And, and com good companies, by the way, like Commonwealth Fusion, who, you know, raised over a couple billion dollars, I think, to, to build the world's first superconducting tokamak. That's actually going to do DT fusion they call Spark. Um, it's quite possible that, um, you know, there, there's new physics discovered that makes fusion easier, you know, than some of the, some of the concerns I have could go away. And I think if that happens, that's great. <laughs> that's actually really good for the world and really good for humanity. I'm not worried about that at all. I do think from a standpoint of like 
our company and its success, it's not going to take away from that, right? They're not going to suddenly become an imaging company. There's a lot of infrastructure around that. They're not going to suddenly become an isotope production company, a lot of infrastructure around that. They're focused on power and they're going to go to power and they beat us to power. That's, that's a great thing for humanity and I'm not too worried about it. I don't think that'll happen. That's not my bet, obviously, uh, or I'd be pursuing that, but um, it would be wonderful if it did. Okay, let me add a, a few words, yeah. Uh, Greg gave a fantastic talk, so this, uh, congratulations again. Yeah, I can tell it to you in five different languages <laughs> if you want. Uh, many of the things that Greg talked about, um, if you were a naysayer, you say, oh, it's been done before, been tried before, yeah? There is sort of separation. When I worked at Oak Ridge for about 20 years, my lab was located in one of the buildings that held calutrons, yeah? That was the first technology developed, electromagnetic separation technology for trying to enrich uranium, yeah? After the first few grams were produced, they quickly decided they were not going to win the war by waiting another 20 years, yeah? So K25, gaseous diffusion came about and the rest is history, yeah? So that's one part, yeah? You're doing something over here that is different, yeah? That, that is more value-added proposition for a different type of isotope, a different marketplace. You're not going to make money enriching uranium using what your technology is on that front. Yeah? Would you agree on yeah. that front? Okay, yeah. so that's great. Then, of course, we are talking about accelerators or neutrons for transmutation of waste. About, about 10 years ago, once again, if you were a naysayer, you said, well, this has been tried before. Uh, there was a presidential review board that was set up. I actually chaired that particular board, yeah? And uh, Los Alamos' idea was to essentially use an accelerator, produce neutrons, to then transmute the actinides, and tie it with a couple of power plants associated with that. When the price tag came up, it was half a trillion dollars. And at that time, that was something like 10% of the federal government. There was no way you could, co you could compete with the, a, a typical congressman to sort of try to make it happen. Now, once again, if you're, if you're not an ACR and you're trying to look at it from a positive perspective, you're trying to position yourself in just the right way, in the sweet spot, so to speak, to try to make it happen, which is what I really, really appreciate. Yes, Mara? One little kink that I see, you ask the question, what, what can possibly just shoot out of the woodwork is our relationships with the rest of the world, especially with Russia especially with Russia, you know, right now people are talking about high say LU, I mean, 20%. Well, Russia was the only place you could get it from, yeah? Well, but now our relationships have soured and all of a sudden people are saying, hey, I may be costing twice as much, but I can still make it happen over here and people will be willing to pay that price. Now, what happens if your relationships with President Putin completely reverse all of a sudden, yeah? Don't think it's not possible, believe me, yeah? Or, you know, depending on the administration you get, that might just change on a dime, so to speak, yeah? All of a sudden, your business model has changed. So those are the kinds of things that I guess one needs to be sort of remain cognizant of so that you don't get blindsided. Position yourself to make it a national security imperative for the United States to have its own such technology base to not be blindsided, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's what I think, okay. Good point. Yeah, and, and to add on to what you're saying, one of the applications you talked about at the very beginning, but we haven't talked about a lot recently, is the radiation hardening of electronics. That is a very growing area and a big workforce development issue within the national security sector, kind of along the lines that Rusi was mentioning. Here at Purdue, uh, I'm part of the SCALE program, which is a workforce development uh, program through DOD. And one of the critical areas in that is radiation hardening of electronics. So I think that's also a way to kind of uh, potentially give you another area of development in case, you know, someone comes with one of these uh, critical technical surprises, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. You'll always have another area that you can go. Um, I'll, I'll just mention real quickly, you know, when we say these things come around, I, I mean, I've been in my field for 30 years and we did this already once and it failed miserably. <laughs> and if you just packed everything up and walked away, you know, you, you never know. And now all of a sudden we've gone from, you know, where we used to be to technologies advanced, uh, tracer methodologies advanced, uh, the, the actual drug molecules have advanced. Um, some of my colleagues in the medical field basically say this is the most exciting time they've seen in the treatment of patients using radiopharmaceuticals in 30 to 40 years. 
And so sometimes if you just hang tight and pay attention to what's going on, you might be surprised this stuff, this stuff comes back around. Yeah, and just one last thought is that um, we, especially how universities can help, is that um, we need to make fusion and fission exciting again. Uh, it, there's a lot of competition, especially with computer science, a lot of folks are going there. Um, getting good talent coming to nuclear engineering is not easy. Uh, we see that, um, especially at Purdue and other universities. Uh, how we achieve that, I would say we need, of course, more, more folks like Greg. Uh, we need more uh, involvement with universities. We need test beds. We need facilities because students, they want to see things. They want to feel things. Um, right now, you know, nuclear engineering, you talk about neutrons and theory and Boltzmann transport equations, things that students don't see. And um, we started the summer camp here at Purdue um, two years ago, and we bring high schoolers. And you cannot imagine how excited they are to see a reactor. They can see the reactor, they can do experiments, they can operate the reactor, and you see their eyes going, wow. And then we see them coming to nuclear. When before, and, and we had this questionnaire, like, what did you, what did you wanna do your major before and after the summer camp? And you see a lot of them were like uh, computer science or bio this or all the, um, a lot of them, they changed. And we actually see them now coming to nuclear. So we do need um, to make nuclear not just theoretical, imaginary, we need to have actual tangible labs and virtual reality or test beds and, of course, internships with, with companies like SHI. I, I want to explore that just a little bit. So what career paths, what jobs, what, what knowledge do we need in the workforce to be able to support this type of technology that doesn't, either doesn't exist today or needs to change? And then as we're looking at recruiting and, and uh, helping students direct their career path, what should we be talking about? How do we do that? I think that's yeah, I'm sure. Um, well, with fusion, you know, there's there's certainly a need for scientist level people, PhD trained people who can really move the needle forward it, from a simulation standpoint, but also really a lot of hands on type work. You know, you you just really got to build stuff. Um, so I think there's really a need there, but I, I think more profoundly and, and probably more importantly, um, you just need a lot of really good engineers. Like you, you just need people who can turn, like when the, where the rubber meets the road is where all the magic is, right? You can come up with the coolest scientific concepts, you can come up with the coolest physics designs, the, the neatest ideas. But when you try and turn those into reality, it's insanely difficult. Our biggest technical challenges have all been en implementation engineering, right? Like turning this into a real plant that really produces product all the time. Uh, and so you just need really good engineers who are really excited and, and want to bring their best ability to play. I think the topic you touched on previously of, of inspiration is even a precursor to that, right? Like, how, how do you build that? Well, I'm guessing a lot of people in the room here, you know, maybe feel like previous generations have kind of left them a big mess. Um, and, you know, let's try and help, right? Let's try and do something to, to make that better and get them excited about being part of that, right? So. I think you can do that, and then you get them to, to, to help. Is it? Everyone says they're the future, but they are. Um, and, and so you need to get people excited, then you need to give them the right skills and ability to contribute. And I think for, for us, and as I look at fusion, and you know, in our specific path, it's, it's mostly, mostly engineers. Right? We're primarily an engineering company. It's not nuclear engineers, it's some nuclear engineers, but it's mostly just really good engineers. And then for our company specifically, you know, there's a huge overlap with radiochemistry, which I think is a massive capability here at Purdue already. Um, we're doing it in medicine. We're doing it, actually, we're doing it in phase one. We're doing deuterium and tritium isotopic separation, um, which is beyond chemistry. It's like isotopic separation. Uh, and we're doing, uh, and we're doing, you know, ytterbium enrichment and, and recycling nuclear waste is going to be a massive radiochemistry experiment. And let's not be under any illusions. The first fusion power plants are going to generate nuclear waste. It's commonly said that they won't, but that's a lie. Um, DT power plants will create a lot of nuclear waste. It'll be shorter lived. They're gonna make a lot, and we're gonna need radiochemists to deal with that too. So, you know, for us specifically, that's a huge area of development, I think, going forward. I think if you look on like the pharmaceutical manufacturing side, um, you know, this is not Eli Lilly making a tablet or, or something. It, it is. If you look at it from a federal regulatory perspective, the same rules apply. You just now have to add an isotope that goes away in the next 10 days and have to figure out how to pull all of this off. But the other, so, so 
obviously people who are well versed in the pharmaceutical manufacturing space are critical, but what you'll see is when you walk into one of our manufacturing facilities, there's robots that no one else in the world has ever seen before because there's a very unique step that has to be performed, but I can't hold X number of curies of radioactivity in my hand while I'm trying to carry it off. And so the innovation in that space, it may be done in a hot cell where I'm not physically touching it, but somebody came up with that robot that figured out how to do exactly each step at, at the precise time. And so, you know, I think we all know the role of an engineer in this, whether it's mechanical, chemical, nuclear, there's plenty of opportunities in this space just from the medicine side. Um, so not only just how we're going to make isotope, but what we're going to do with it when we're done. And remote operations like that are essential for both fission and fusion. So as you think about ways to reduce cost in this industry going forward, remote capability like that is absolutely essential. So there's overlap, significant overlap between the medical and the energy side there. Okay. If I may, uh, <clears throat> there was a, just one study that's been done that was done in the 1990s, late 1990s. Yeah? How large is the footprint of nuclear technology? Most people think it's just nuclear power, waste included and so on. It was a good five to seven percent of the GDP of the United States, yeah? And it's remained at about the same level. What's the GDP of the United States today? It's about 26 trillion dollars, yeah? Do the math. It'll be something like over a trillion dollars. Now, how wide a footprint is that, yeah? Health is definitely one of them, yeah? Okay, there's industry, even diapers. You want a super absorb in diaper? Pampers and so on are using radiation-based cross-linking and so on to improve that particular absorbency by a factor of two or three. Anybody who's got kids, I know I've had three and I know how important that is, yeah? Okay, it plays in every walk of life. We actually teach a course at Purdue, by the way. It's called Nano to Macro Scale Applications of Nuclear Technology, where we're trying to bring out the entrepreneurial spirit in our students to sort of appreciate the fact that it's not just nuclear energy, yeah? not just nuclear energy, it covers virtually all walks of life. So the question at the end of the course is, show me one area in life that is not touched by nuclear technology. Don't show me where it is applied, but where it is not being applied, yeah? And the outcome is enormous. It's, up, it's over trillion and a half dollars over the footprint, yeah? Not even including the entire health, health arena that you talked about. I myself have, stepped up on one of those platforms and then done that jog to find out if my arteries were clogged. Yeah, Mara? And thank God for Molly 99, yeah? Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind, yeah? For all of you folks that are listening, nuclear engineering is not just for nuclear engineers, yeah? It is for the entire world, so to speak, yeah? If you take that perspective, you'll find opportunities for applying your technological skills to virtually any walk of life. Chemical engineering, mechanical, the way, you can, you, you can look almost anywhere, including this room. It's full of radon gas. We are breathing it. There's some impact on your cells and so on, yeah? There's radiation in your bodies and... Okay, you get the message, yeah, Mar? So, so to add on to the workforce development aspect, uh, one of the things I think about coming from one of my past lives where I was a submarine officer is what does it take to actually have a reactor? So, you know, you always think about the engineers, right? This is an engineering college, so of course that's the first thing. But one of my jobs on the submarine was I was in charge of managing the technicians in charge of all the radiation exposure. So you're going to need your health science people, the people that do the radiation health assessments. You need to make sure you have those training people. But the, probably the most important people, once you get to an operational state, are the technicians. And this is even true in research when I was in industry. I mean, we had lots of PhD engineers, and you know, we came up with the big ideas, but a lot of times we would get stuck because we didn't have qualified technicians to actually go and do the hand work. And that, I think that's a critical aspect of this as you go to the technology development, is having technicians with the right training and education to be able to come and support that. Agreed. And I should mention, we can teach you how to handle radiation safely. That, I mean, that's fundamentally my job here. Um, you know, and all of these 
you know, we referred to the NRC and things like that. Those are all critical steps in getting any of this up and running is how do we make sure that the people working in our space are doing so safely at very low risk and, you know, being able to carry out all we do and occupationally being able to do your job. Oh, yeah. That's right. Radiation safety, real or perceived, can be a very costly enterprise. Yeah, if you recall the event in Fukushima about 10 years ago or so, uh, the courts in Japan specifically targeted three executives from Tokyo Electric and asked them, asked them individually to pay up $97 billion. Imagine going bankrupt a million times over. Yeah, Mar? You know. But let's, let's talk about the okay. safety aspect a little bit, and actually yeah. really more the public relations piece, because the university has a big part of that. Obviously, private industry does as well. Uh, it seems like every time things start to calm down, we have a new movie that comes out that scares everybody or an event. I noticed that, that Shine doesn't use the word nuclear fusion in, in your, uh, in your work a, a lot. I mean, it, it seems like you stick with just plain fusion. Most people I'm sure that's that. intentional. We did say nuclear and fusion on many of us. <laughs> true, true. We're one of the few companies that actually combines those. So, so how do we, you know, what can we do as, as, as university, as private industry to improve the public image of this entire segment? To have talks like this. I mean, I, you know, it, so radiation gets a bad rap. It's all around us, as, as was mentioned. It's insanely easy to measure, which is part of the problem, right? Like, it's easy to freak people out with a clicking Geiger counter. But the truth is you can measure it at thresholds of probably a million to a billion times below where it would have any health effect. And, and it's one of the easiest things to measure with the right instrumentation. So it's, it's a world of radiation. And this has even been a learning thing at Shine, right? Like, where we had people working with tritium and you know, we were talking about them getting dose and, and they would get dose reports and we didn't educate them properly, right? And it's like, oh God, I got a millirem of dose. And it's like, okay, well, do you understand that existing, you get a millirem a day? But that's just being here in the world, right? If you live at higher altitude, it's more like four or 500. If you have had, have been around people getting medical tests or have had any medical tests yourself, it's higher than that. Put it in perspective, a CT abdominal scan, if, if a doctor thinks you have appendicitis, you're getting about a thousand millirem um, for a diagnostic scan. So, you know, it, it's like, just gotta talk about it. It's not that scary. It's like anything. Like if I have too much water, I'm gonna drown. If I don't have enough, I'm gonna die. Um, th then there's another problem, which is the way our regulatory bodies handle radiation. We talked about this earlier today. The NRC has rooted themselves politically, not scientifically, in something they call linear no threshold theory, which is the idea that any amount of radiation above zero is harmful. That's proven false. Um, it's known that there is a, a curve-like effect that actually small amounts of radiation are almost certainly biologically beneficial, up to a point at which it reverses and then above a certain threshold it becomes harmful. That's, that's life, that's reality, that's, that's what happens. And, and it's like anything in the body, like small amounts of damage are good I work out, I break my muscles, it makes them stronger. If I drop a safe on my head, I die, right? Like, you know, don't do too much all at once, um, but radiation's the same way. So we just gotta like, you guys should go learn about it, talk about it. It's, it's really an important tool in fighting climate change. It's really important for so many other things as a two-year-old actively changing, as a father of a two-year-old actively changing diapers, I'm grateful for the, the cross-link polymers. Um, so yeah, it's just like not that big, big a deal. I think people just need to talk about it. Like it's gonna take a lot of organic grassroots stuff, I think. The other thing is just to remember to put everything in context, like life's trade-offs. What's worse, this or that? I guess you really have to change the philosophy on regulation. It was set up because if you, it is a very hot topic today in the, in the I guess, radiation health physics community. Why did it even come up to this particular point? Yep, Mara? It was based upon misinterpretation of some data by someone. It's like National Enquirer, okay? I mean, the, the, the kind of human dynamics that are associated with these kinds of things, yeah? But it's now become part of the, of the culture of the regulators. Any amount of radiation above zero is too much. And as a consequence, the costs associated with this particular technology are being borne as a consequence of that particular mis misguided philosophy. Eh? So uh, we really need to change that. And I guess one th way to change that is through education. Yeah? 
And that's where universities like these do play a major role, I would think, yeah? I can tell you when I came, to, I came to Purdue, I got my pharmacy degree here and I went into nuclear and my father um, makes me wash my hands every time I come to his house. And I'm like, dad, first of all, I have people that do that for me now, but um, it's but ingrained in their head that generation was nuclear is bad, nuclear is bad. Um, not too long ago, I went to a talk um, from a health physicist who basically said, you know, this generation is much more engaged in, you know, clean energy and the climate change. And you know, when you see where nuclear fits into that, it's a logical step, not an illogical step. And I think, you know, just with time, we've definitely seen a shift in people's understanding of what radiation is and what it can do for you. And our job is to keep pointing out to folks that we can do this, we can do this safely, and that there is a long-term benefit from it, even a short-term benefit, if we do it correctly. Yeah. And to add on to what Rusi was saying too, one of the key aspects is you have to think about why the regulations are how they are, right? And if you go back historically, when the regulations were first made, what did people know about nuclear engineering and radiation? Right, it was from World War II from the nuclear weapons test. So everything back then was about minimizing risk completely. And the idea was that minimizing risk was zero, right? You wanted to have zero. And getting to what you were talking about, what's called the hormesis effect, that some amount of radiation is good for you. And when I teach the introduction to nuclear engineering class and I go through the biological safety portion, you know, there's, there's data on, you know, what different sorts of exposures you get if you're in an airplane and how much life you'll lose due to having X amount of radiation. And one of the things I always point out is when you look at that, it has how many days you lose by being alive. How much of your life you lose by being alive because of just being exposed to radiation. Um, final thing I'll point out is that when you look at radiation, right, what is it doing to you? It's affecting the bonds in the body. There's nothing unique about radiation doing that. Chemicals also do that. The only thing that makes it scarier is that you cannot see radiation because it's all around you, right? It's not something you see. You can see a chemical. You can't see radiation. And that's one of the reasons people get were scared about it, even though fundamentally it still does the same thing as, say, some caustic chemical would do. I'd argue there's a lot of chemicals you can't see. I mean, exactly. in, insanely small amounts of mercury in your water, um, mm -hmm. you know, little contaminants in your food. Hell, plastic that we've been putting our food in for decades may have been harming us. I think people are still trying to figure out if there's been genetic variation as a result of that. Yeah, so. and they're not talking about nanoplastics and <laughs> microplastics and all these things, right? Yeah, there's, there's lots of things that, that we don't see that harm us. Yeah, yeah. And, and fundamentally, like, you know, if I said to you I was going to have to treat your cancer, everybody goes immediately to chemo. Well, what we do does exactly the same thing chemo does. It basically breaks the bonds, disrupts the cell cycle, and ends up killing off a cell. That's our goal. We just do it a slightly different way. But, you know, fundamentally, it's kind of chemo, I guess. Some people call it kind of chemo. But, like but, but it does, it does that to healthy cells, too. Smart chemo. Yeah. yeah, the biggest problem you see with chemo is chemo can't pick and choose right. which cell it is. It's a cell, I'll kill it. Whereas here, we put our radioactivity on a molecule that takes it directly to the cell that we want it to kill, That's and now the normal cells are fine. Much smarter. Yeah. If a quick point here, I'm just going to offer like a slightly different point of view. Um, yes, the linear non-threshold hypothesis is, is not correct, or it's an overestimation, or it's a way to over-engineer everything. Um, I think it's going to be much harder to change this mentality. And the reason is that, I think you mentioned that in your presentation, that. I think 95% of the people out there, they benefit from it. They benefit from this overregulation because they make money, because they're consultants, and they will come to consult you how to um, submit your application and how to meet this hypothesis. Also, for us as educators, it's also difficult to say that this hypothesis is not true when all textbooks say that it's true. Right? So yes, there's recent evidence that says for misses, but uh, you cannot just start saying, hey, guys, you know, you're safe with 10 milliram or 5 milliram. That, that's really hard to do. So it's really, we really have to juggle and we have to balance what we say to students. Keep in mind, most of that data was collected by people who were, you know, impacted by the atomic bomb, right? They got a huge amount of radiation. Very, very good point. Yeah. I'll and tell you what, what's really happened is um, much of the data that I use for low levels of radiation and so on are based upon my studies, yeah? That were conducted at Oak Ridge by a husband and wife team. Leon, Russell, and, and so on, Yifmar. And they were looking at genetic defects that could possibly come up, and they, they mixed the two. 
high levels of radiation versus low levels. And that was misconstrued, some say deliberately, to win a prize, et cetera, and all of those things. Now, this is becoming in the National Enquirer type, type, type arena, which we cannot get into over here. But this kind of a, jo a, a, a information base given out to the public to make a point from a highly regarded individual or individual team then sets into motion a decades-long practice in the field, which is what we are now suffering from. Yeah? Because of this, the Hanford site, for example, the cost for remediation has gone up to something like over a trillion dollars. Just because they're saying it's got to be below five millirem per year for any individual in a 10 mile radius. Yeah? So, so, so let, me, let me redirect that or, or expand that a little bit. So thinking back, when, when coal was used as our major energy source, it was a huge boon to industry, to, to humanity in general, but then there were a lot of problems from that. Uh, Rudolf Diesel thought he was solving that by, with the creation of di the diesel engine uh, a little over 100 years ago. And uh, between uh, what he did and Standard Oil with the Rockefellers and all, they, you know, they thought they, were, they had the answers. And of course, we've seen problems with that. Uh, when I was young, there was still a belief that nuclear power, fission power, was the answer. And of course, we've seen issues with that, and that's not caught on. Now, it's, you know, now we're looking for other, other solutions. If we were looking ahead 50 years from now, and fission works and it's now adopted, what problems might we be trying to solve then? What, you know, what do you see as the major issues that, that uh, the world's gonna be looking at? Well, I think they'll be social. I mean, I think they, they are social. I mean, we're, we're all talking about technological problems and I think those are important, right? But you know, it, it, I have a lot of friends in fusion who like to claim fusion can solve all the world's problems, right? It's like abundant energy and medicine, nuclear waste, all, you know, but fundamentally, I think our problems are, are going to be social and related to each other and just distributions of wealth and, and things like that. You know, how do you make that equitable and, and yet incentivize people for the right behaviors and, and things like I'm not sure I don't have the answers for that. Um, you know, I hope fission power is abundant in 50 years. If we solve the cost problem, I think it can be. I think the linear no threshold, all that aside, like fundamentally we need to address the cost cost problem. So hopefully that's there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, the, the dreamer in me wants fusion to be on the horizon and, and give us so much energy we can do just things we can't even imagine doing today, make it so cheap. But I think fundamentally the biggest problems are gonna be social in nature. I guess in a country like the United States, which is the private sector that's responsible for nuclear power and so on, everything that we've seen so far indicates unless it's commercial IB viable, number one, or you have a national security-based perspective brought into play. You mentioned, I guess, those two reactors out in Georgia, eh? instead of costing 10 billion now, it's about $30 billion, yeah? But it still got built. It's important to keep in mind, first of a kind, after 30 years of inactivity, it still got better. Now we've got that particular knowledge base, supply chains, and all of those things. The next one ought not to cost even a fraction of that excess. Yeah? Now, all of a sudden, the perspective is different. And I will contend with anybody that thou shalt not blame nuclear for not being safe enough. Yeah? Show me some other industry that comes down to such low risk levels. Yeah? It is safe. Now, how much safer do you want to be here? Yeah? Now, we've got this probabilistic safety analysis-based approach for risk-informed decision-making by the NRC, which is actually a very positive step. Yeah? You have some quantifiable measure, rather than saying, put another layer of containment over your reactor, now you'll be a bit more safer. Yeah? You're already safe. Why do you want another one? How many jetliners are you going to crash on it? You know, I mean, you've already proven that you can withstand one big jet line of crash, yeah? Does any other industry have that kind of a limitation, yeah? No. So I think it's safe enough. We ought not to be asking these kinds of questions. I mean, are you going to be safe into the future? We are already safe, yeah? You can always improve safety to whatever extent you can, as long as it does not hurt the bottom line to the point that you just put yourself out of business, yeah? Go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm just 
coming from that area where Chernobyl has been just blown up. I'm living in Belarus, it's like a nearby country. Oh, welcome. And ju just in that place, specifically, I've seen a lot of relatives, a lot of friends, and a lot of other people being harmed by the explosion. So, for instance, like my father also had some problems with health because of that nuclear blown up that day. Uh, it's just that uh, I think in the history I've read that it was not the reactor design problem, but rather a managerial problem of people trying to push the reactor into its limits. If I'm, am I mistaken? It's both. Well, uh, <laughs> for Chernobyl, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> A resounding yes, the design itself was faulty, there was no containment and so on, and of course, the way in which they constructed the reactor itself with the graphite rods, and I guess all of that was asking for trouble. It's so it's, so it's, it's more like nuclear is extremely safe, but people who are in operating the nuclear power plant may cause the trouble. Well, it, I mean, I think it depends, right? I mean, my whole entire premise of my world is figuring out how to use radiation to kill something. It happens to be a tumor cell, but, you know, something you don't want. There's a big difference between I got a whole bunch of radiation dose right now versus I get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. You know, you know the body is remarkable in that, yes, maybe it did cause a little bit of damage, but your cells can repair themselves. And so I think it, it's... You cannot argue that Chernobyl was not a major issue, but that you could also point out that that is not how we distribute radioactive materials to you normally. That, that is an, a, an anomaly that we know that that would be problematic. And so our goal is, you know, just like most of you probably know somebody who has had radiation therapy, right? So, and you, you, the worst part about radiation therapy is you go in, you have a dose, and you go away 10 minutes later. You know, it's a 10 minute visit every day for 16 weeks. And the reason why is because we give you radiation that hopefully will cause damage to those cells, but then we give your body time to recover so your normal cells get better, and then we do it again and again and again. And so there's always that lag time where we let your body heal itself naturally, but the cells that aren't going to heal itself naturally are going to die. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the mentality of what we're talking about, right? We're giving you a little radiation, and we might have to give you a little radiation multiple times in medicine to make it work, but fundamentally, it's, it's going to kill the cells we need it to kill, and that's yeah, I mean, what it's for. Yeah, and, and I just want to point out that technology has changed since Chernobyl. Like it has changed a lot, right? Um, right now, they're, the newer designs, they're passive work, passive away safety. Even if you wanted to do something bad, the reactor, it's, it's really not something that can happen. Um, uh, in addition, there are newer designs, there are smaller designs, smaller source term, uh, and, and, and of course, like you said, in 2050, we'll still be working on, on improving the designs, potentially control. Well, the but, like Chernobyl was designed, it's a gra graphite moderated reactor that was designed for plutonium production and then converted to energy generation. Positive reactor. And so th this, is the, this is why Chernobyl broke. I mean, it was a test. It was an intentional test that caused the reactor to destroy itself. Yeah. But it had what's called positive reactivity feedback which means that if there is a condition in the reactor which causes it to increase power, the fundamental physics of the reactor responds by amplifying that increase. That doesn't exist in the commercial power business basically anywhere uh, except for Russia, or the former Soviet Union, I should say. Um, and, and those reactors were not specifically intended initially for energy generation. They use graphite because um, unlike light water, it doesn't absorb neutrons, gives you the best neutron economy, which is the best for making lots of plutonium for lots of nuclear weapons. So. When you look specifically at reactors design, it's not that they can't melt down, they can, but you won't have an explosive power excursion. I believe Chernobyl at peak power was at about 300 times its rated power. So you have something that's made to produce thousands of megawatts of heat, now producing hundreds of times that, right? It blew up, it caused a steam explosion. <laughs> it's just so much heat. And that, that, that doesn't happen. Like the, the meltdown process is slow. You get something like Three Mile Island, you get something like Fukushima. Um, you know, disasters to be sure, economic disasters, but in terms of human health, really a non-issue. In fact, I think there were more, more deaths, more, more stress on humans from the evacuation of Fukushima Prefecture than from radiation. I don't think there's really any directly attributable deaths there. So designs help, make them the right way. Uh, and then, yeah, you should consider testful, but you can't leave it up. You just can't leave it up to the humans. Like, you, you, you want as much passive safety as you can. I, I, I felt the design at Chernobyl. 100%. <laughs> so let me, let me switch gears just 
quickly here. I, I was struck by, you know, we're, we're sitting in Armstrong Hall, and you think about the, the nature of the, the moon mission and the cooperation between government and private industry. How difficult is it to do this as a private entity, and what can be done to make it easier to work with universities, with government, regulatory, et cetera, to, to make this a reality? Or, you know, maybe say, what, what hurdles are in your way, and then collectively, what can we be doing to make that easier? Fusion's a moonshot, fusion energy, um, to be clear. Like, it is not gonna be easier than Apollo, it's gonna be harder. Um, we know less about what we need to know than we knew about Apollo when that program was started. We could fly rockets. You know, we, we, we knew how to launch things pretty far, pretty well, control rockets, they were used in the war. Um, you know, we had a better, we had a better footing uh, than we do on fusion. The, the number of disciplines, the, the degree of the technical challenges are massively higher. You're gonna need an insane amount of collaboration to move fusion forward quickly, at least from a power perspective. Um, and that's gonna be information sharing across companies developing things that aren't used to doing that. That's gonna be government collaboration. It's gonna need a lot of government financial support. Um, the government may have to do an Apollo-like program where they just buy three of everything. I mean, I think the most essential systems on Apollo the government contracted like three different vendors for every single system, right? They're just like, somebody's gonna get it right. Um, so, you know, if it becomes a national priority to that extent, maybe we can do something. Eater is an example of an international collaboration that's not going so well um, and has not been since I've been in grad school, right? So it's not like this is new news there. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I think it's just like, it's, you're gonna need a, uh, an openness that it's not easy to come by. I'm not quite sure how to make it happen. The, I guess reality is we have done it before already. There are space propulsion reactors that were built during the 1950s and 60s. SNAP, for example. The Russians had their own version, which we used for some time. <laughs> and they still use them for their own special missions. Yep, matter. So it's already been done. Space nuclear power is a reality. Eh? It's been demonstrated, and now we are trying to modernize that particular uh, approach through DARPA. DARPA and NASA have teamed up to build, together to come up with something called the DRACO program, D-R-A-C-O, yeah? And that is essentially this. It's a realization that's been done before. We can do it again, yeah? So it's there. It's yeah, there. I, just... I think we need to be positive about it, that when it can be done, it's been done before, and we're going to do it even in today's regulatory climate, yeah? Clarifying that's fission versus fusion. Yeah, fission, fission. Fusion is a completely separate story. <laughs> the only approach to engineering gain being greater than one has been, opposed, has been achieved only through nuclear weapons, yeah? Fusion weapons, thermonuclear fusion bombs, yeah? That's the only approach. Engineering gain greater than one, not scientific gain greater than one like you saw at NIP. Engineering gain, they're off by a factor of a few hundred, yet. So let's hear from some others. What, what can Purdue University specifically be doing to support this kind of research and development? Um, I think uh, from our end, we uh, obviously are actively engaging the manufacturers that are based in Indiana. Indiana, um, for a variety of reasons, has become kind of a centralized hotbed for radiopharmaceutical manufacturing, um, probably mostly because of the FedEx hub in Indianapolis. Um, when you have short-lived isotopes, you don't have the luxury of it having sitting on a shelf for three or four weeks. It has to be out the door, and when FedEx guy doesn't want to put it on his plane, that might tank a $60,000 dose. So, you know, there are a lot of those logistics. And I think what's, what's been really interesting for me personally in our space is the companies realize there are these fundamental sets of problems that everybody's gonna have. Don't worry about the fact that we're gonna compete about whose drug is the best and who, who gets ordered more than whatever, but there are these fundamental platforms that have to be addressed and solved and figured out so that everyone can be successful in the space. And I mean, I give big kudos to the, the radio pharmaceutical manufacturers because they have recognized that and someday they'll be competing, but we all have to get to a point where we're able to compete. And that might be dealing with regulatory issues. It might be dealing with supply chain management. It might be finding the best you know, robot that will help us do these kind of things. And I think that's where a university like Purdue really plays a huge role because, I mean, I think all of us 
kind of knew each other, you know, but we didn't necessarily work together. But now here's this place where we're all coming together. And even though we have very distinctly different roles at the university, they all play together. And I think finding those places and getting everybody together in a place where we can all brainstorm and think it through is critical. And hopefully we have folks that come in who have the manufacturing side or the background who take advantage of this expertise in these places. No pressure. Okay. It's an engineering school, right? I mean, like, let's make some engineers, right? Uh, you know, I think radiochemistry is one place we've talked about that I think will be important for fusion. I think it's important for medicine. I think it's important for nuclear waste. Um, you know, let's, but like material scientists, like there's a lot to be done in material science. Like superconductor manufacturing, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done in making high temperature superconducting tape and continuing to evolve that landscape. Like there's a lot of engineering there. Uh, you know, shielding design, right? These are engineering feats. Um, the magnet design on Spark, right? It's not so much the critical field or the superconducting tape, but now you've got some of the strongest superconducting magnets. You're trying to put them in an array where the forces on them are so stupidly high, the thing could just tear itself apart, right? So hopefully it doesn't, hopefully it's well engineered, but you need really good mechanical engineers to be able to fit this stuff all in a space. And then as they go on to arc, where they want to make a lot of DT neutrons, those magnets have to move out which means they need to get bigger. And if you want to make the same field, they need to move out for shielding reasons. Now the forces are much higher because you have the same field with a much bigger surface area. So like there's just a huge need for a lot of engineering talent um, across the board. So I think we should teach people, get them excited about fusion. I think we should get them excited about medicine. Uh, and I think we should have hard engineering programs and do research, right? Like let's contribute, let's work with the companies, let's get people, I mean, we love our interns, right? Like. Let's do things like that too. Get people excited. Show them some real-world applications while we're teaching them, you know, the fundamentals in class. I guess at Purdue we do have a research reactor on campus, and we are thinking about a small modular reactor already. So, uh, and besides, we've got you on the stage over here. So let us invite you. I'm just speaking for myself, not for Purdue, to have one of your systems on campus, okay. and I guess involve students directly. I mean, you you can't beat the cost of labor for graduate students compared to what you're paying, yeah? Understand. And, you know, I mean, uh, take a partnership along those lines, take a risk, and let more companies like you join hands with universities in their neighborhoods, and especially friendly universities that are looking at this thing in a positive light rather than trying to put it back, yeah? Mm -hmm. So here's a thought, yeah? Well, we're at a minimum open to partnering on a radiation studies. <laughs> okay, well, let me go. Yeah, and, and I know that some places, particularly in Research Triangle, they actually set up consortia where multiple companies put in some money and it gets divvied up to the university, and then there are agreements about how to share the IP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as the industry grows, it's not there yet where it's huge. Maybe there's some logic to kind of pooling for common problems. Mm -hmm. They said you might want a, a satellite campus in West Lafayette, like many other companies are doing now. Yeah, no? yeah. We, we have done that. We're, we're doing that in the radio pharmaceutical manufacturing space, the consortium yeah. where there you everybody go. can come together. But I mean, the one thing I always like to say when I'm talking to students is, I mean, you guys, right? You're the future. You're the ones that are going to come out and dazzle us in, in this field and in the next generation and take us to the next places. And so, you know, just because we might not have the expertise here, most of us could find somebody that might have the expertise and get you hooked into it. So, you know, dream big. That's probably the best yeah. thing you can tell a student is dream big and we'll try to help you figure out how to get to that point. But if you don't ask us, we're also probably not going to drive you in that way as readily. So, you know, you guys can take control of your destiny pretty easily here in a place like Purdue and we'll help you figure out how to make it happen. Yeah, and yeah, and fully agree. Uh, and from a university standpoint, we definitely need to bring new talent, and we need to make nuclear fission and fusion exciting again. And we can also take a lot of the risk. We, we can carry the risk that you know a private domain cannot. So we can look into new technology. We can look, hey, can you use AI machine learning to control the plasma or do some experiment design, find new materials, uh, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing. These are the things that. We can do this research in the university and then, of course, uh, transition that to, to the industry. Yeah, I think another, we just flip this around. This might cause chaos, so maybe it's not a good idea. But, like, I don't know. Like, are you guys excited about the, trying to solve these kinds of problems? Like, what's, like, we're, you know, we need, yeah, to your point, like, we need feedback. How do we motivate you? Um, we're all like, you know, what can, what, 
know, what skills can you build? But it's, it's about motivation. Like I mentioned, like I think our biggest problems in 50 years are going to be the same as now. I think it'd be social. How do we motivate people to contribute? How do we motivate people to care and, and want to give what they have, right? Like, that's, uh, yeah. What if we, I mean, what if we integrate uh, kind of presentation skills or, or uh, public relations into the curriculum of the new great idea. engineering uh, field? I mean, I, I, I can see countless, ex uh, I can see countless examples in my own classes and such uh, uh, of where outreach could be done and it doesn't yet, um, and it doesn't, leave the classroom because it, it at the end of the day it, we we struggle as, as scientists to bring our vernacular and our totally. and everything else to the public if we can bridge that gap i think uh integrating things like the summer camps or hands-on experience can be much more accessible that's a good point i agree okay I was going to say, um, you talked a lot about SpaceX, and I think they've contributed a lot to space exploration in the public's mind just due to publicity and different things with that. And I think, um, I think you're doing something similar there now with, with Fusion. I think just involving other companies, involving people, having champions um, in the public that can be, become public figures, championing this, I think, is one thing. Awesome. So I think this is a, a two-front problem. Obviously, you want to inspire the younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've spoken about this uh, to some people in my hometown that are interested in getting industry in there. Um, I've said, you know, you have to inspire people from a young age. And I, maybe I might be dating myself here, but nothing made me happier than when the teacher would push out the, the TV on the cart and watch Bill Nye. Right, like it was a very exciting time. He made the science fun. He, you know, because at a at a very fundamental level, elementary schools, middle school students, they're not taught to love science and engineering. Uh, you mentioned that you know during recess you sort of had that self drive. We have to teach people to have that that drive, um, and it's through these sort of PBS type education um, programs. But then also on the regulation side of things, I think a lot of people and companies are facing. Um, well, I don't have to tell you, they're facing problems, but that's because they're, they're looking to influence the, the congressman um, when, in fact, they, they are the only ones that are signing these laws. The people who are writing them are their staffers. They're the technical people, and we need to be going to them so that they are writing the technical details that we are interested in you know, getting passed through legislation. It's mm. a good point. Get us start early. Are we done? Yes. I think we got time for maybe one more. Yes, yeah, sorry to kind of take it off the rails, but sorry, no, <laughs> no, no, that's good. Like, sort of adding on to that, like, uh, when I talk to like my like my colleagues, like fellow students, like, oh, why, why nuclear engineering? Like, the by far the biggest reason, like, was like, oh, I watched Iron Man when I was a kid, and like, I thought that was dope, and so, like, I think having a symbol like that, like, stories. And like fiction, like especially like a good story, is a like a fantastic way to like reach the public um, and to inspire them. But like, I mean, I don't know how capable, like how much like Purdue can do that by itself. But um, I guess like something like that, like we could do is more like creating some sort of like icon in like real life. Like, I mean. I, th I, I think sp one of the reasons SpaceX is so popular is because Elon Musk is such a character. Um, and I'm not saying we have to create like a, a character like that, but having someone like, appro like Bill Nye, like it's someone who's approachable and someone who like, so you, like I could feel like I could relate to, seeing them do something like with nuclear and like doing something great that will inspire, that, so seeing stuff like that inspires me to do stuff like like something great as well and i imagine it's similar to for a lot of other people thanks well, I, I could i could go on all day this is a lot of fun uh but we do i know we have some people that need to be leaving here soon craig i'd like to give you a chance to maybe make a last comment or two if you like oh um yeah I, look i mean i think to you guys right like there are people out there who actually want to make 
the world better. I think there's everyone up on this stage actually does. Um, and you know, we're we're hopefully setting it up to hand off the ball, you know, so you can feel good about things. So, and and contribute, right? And actually come into a world that that makes a lot of sense, or maybe maybe it's on a trajectory to make some sense. So, um, it you know, for me, I do it for my two year old, right? I don't do it because I'm the the founder of a company. I I go on long trips and, and she tearfully looks at me and I say, look, I got to go try and help the world. And she says, I know. Right. And so that's, that's awesome. Right. It means a lot. So so it's not all lost. And, and you guys are here and you're at an engineering school. You know, let's let's work together and and and, and spread the word and, and and learn and teach and, and move forward. Um, I think the future is is full of potential. I'm sure this is very cliche, but. You know, I think there's there's just a tremendous amount we can still achieve as a species, uh, and I think we can overcome all of the problems we face. And I say this as a pragmatist who's, who's started a fusion company, yes, on the one hand, but is very you know pragmatic about how how I approach them. There's nothing unmanageable in our future, but we just really need to work together to do it. So um, this is why I asked the question about how do we motivate you all. I, I think it, it comes down to that. If you can find motivation and what to do and, and use that to go and do cool things, um, we're all going to be good. Uh, so maybe we can close on that. Very good. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you.